Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Deanna. And we're the Maladroit Mamas. Life for us is momming, home educating, and calculating everything from the cost of curriculum to the hours spent binging Netflix. And that's both a blessing and a curse. And we want you to embrace your divorce life too. On today's podcast, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to interview a public school teacher, and she is uh, married to my nephew, but I don't consider her a niece-in-law. I consider her a friend first. Her name is Christina. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It is so lovely to have you today. And um, the reason we're going to talk about this is because all over the country, a lot of schools are going virtual. And um, we've heard the term that we're all homeschoolers now, and um, we don't feel that that's exactly true because kids who are staying virtual, they're still be they're still in public schools, and it, it's it's a very different it's very different. And so we wanted to get a teacher's perspective of how last year went and how this year is getting set up. So um, we felt that Christina could provide some valuable insight to that. So we're going to ask her some questions. If you have any questions, you can leave them, drop them in the comments, and um, we'll see if she get back to you. And so we're going to ask her some questions. So, Christina, um, how long have you been teaching, and what specifically do you teach? So I am starting my 16th year of teaching, and I teach 6th, 7th, and 8th grade chorus, and mm -hmm. have for 15 years. Chorus. I did, yes, I did one year of just a general music position and then 15 years of chorus. Oh, wow. Um, what, what age level is it? Is it elementary school or middle or high? Middle school. Middle school. Oh, wow. Okay. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Oh, those are fun years. <laughs> um, Absolutely are. Every <laughs> middle school age children. Is, yes. <laughs> so, um, so you're a, a public school teacher and a middle am. school mm -hmm. and you also, you have children too, right? I Tell do. About your family life and your husband and your children. Sure. So um, we have three children. I should say my husband and I have been married for 15 years and we have three children. My son that is oldest is nine and he'll be starting fourth grade. And then my daughter is six and she will be going into first grade. And then my little guy is three. And okay. yes. So um, my husband traditionally works from home. And so we've been kind oh. of experiencing all of this together. Oh, so he so he normally works from home, even during Correct. non pandemic days. Okay. Correct. That was very different from our families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband does not normally work at home, but he was at home for months. And he just recently uh, was able to return back. But um, so what was that like? Those How was it different? for him to continue working from home? Is it just because you guys were there also? He actually or? said very little was different for him okay. other than us being there. So okay. for him, life kind of, to some degree, continued as normal. He just had more company All right. <laughs> during the day. Um, was having you and the kids at home more distracting for him at all? Um, not really. He has an area in our basement that's set up where he does his work. And I did all of my work upstairs with the kids and primarily okay. kept them up stairs with me so we were kind of in two separate zones yeah all right so the end of last year how did it go like when you when you went virtual like when schools closed down and you went virtual how did it go um, well first of all I would say that when schools closed down we actually had a two-week gap between when schools closed and when we resumed actually for us it was a three-week gap because teachers resumed working after two weeks and then it was three weeks until we had the students um, and I do think that break really set off some of the struggles that we had as we moved forward because I think um, teachers really lost contact with their students mm -hmm. and students lost contact with each other and kind of that feeling of isolation started mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. before we went back to school. Right. Um, and then once everything did begin, um, I would say the most challenging thing for me was that um, we, where I where I teach at, we um, had to do video conferencing. Right. And uh, a lot of the kids did not attend at all, and those who did, did not want to show their faces. And so by the end of the time that we were together, you know, I was looking at avatars or um, ceiling fans and, <laughs> and those kinds of things. And it felt um, definitely the, the least connected I have ever been to my students. So I think it was demoralizing for the teachers. It was, you know, demoralizing for the students. Right. Um, you know, I would have classes where when we were in person, you know, talk, 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 talk. And then it was crickets when we were 
you know, the video conferencing. No right. one wanted to talk. No one wanted to contribute. There was some level of, I think, vulnerability that the students felt being yeah. Oh, yeah. on the video that they did not feel whenever they were in person. That's funny. Since yeah. It, since it's not... Hmm, that's interesting. Right. And as yeah. teachers, we would try to, you know, provide kids even just the opportunity to talk to each other, and they wouldn't, which hmm. was just kind of interesting because, again, when we were in person, you know... They would talk. They would absolutely yeah. talk. They would absolutely talk to each other. Um, and we definitely lost participation as it progressed. Um, you know, and I'm not really sure why, except that I do know that when we started teaching virtually, there was always kind of that, but it's only going to be for a couple of weeks kind of piece to it. Because initially mm -hmm. when we closed, it was going to be for two weeks. And then I think they added three more weeks on after that. And then it was until the middle of May. And then it was finally, okay, this is what we're doing for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if some of the disengagement came from, you know, well, we're just going to not worry about it right now. And we hope that we get back to it. And then when we decided we weren't going back, then it was kind of like, you know, never mind. Um, we did give grades. Um, but we, they determined close to the end of the year that we were going to do a floor grade of 50%. And so I definitely think there were, there were families who just chose, you know, that, that was good enough with, and it was only one marking period. So in most cases, if they had, um, passed their classes, the first three marking periods, this was not going to, you know, make them fail for the year or that kind of thing. Yeah. So I would say those were definitely some of the challenges yeah. that we faced. All right, so our next question is, how are you managing the learning needs of students who have parents that can't engage, such as working, non-English speakers, or just those who are feeling overwhelmed? Sure. So um, I think what is really hard about all of this is, you know, coming from my experience last spring, I know that there is a lot of frustration because there's a lot of parents who are working during the day and are not able to check in with their kids and their schoolwork until the evening. And... We would have some situations where, you know, parents would reach out to us in the evening with questions or concerns. And I would say last spring, we to some degree did some of that still checking the email at night and everything. Um, but next year, um, my school district, you know, teachers are, are reporting to the building and teaching from there. And so to me, it becomes a kind of a question of like, I feel like it's appropriate for us to have boundaries of, you know, yeah. my work day is 830 to four and I answer you know, parent concerns at the same time, understanding that that totally does not work for a lot of parents. And so, you know, I really, I really struggle with what the right answer is. Um, also, um, the school district where I teach, I don't know if they had not thought about it before or, or what, but they also, in looking through all the different platforms that they were asking us to use last year, have determined that a lot of the apps that teachers had used to communicate with parents in the past, like Remind and Class Dojo, actually do not suit our school district and their privacy policies. And so they, you know, recently put out a, you know, a statement that we are just to use email primarily and possibly Google Voice. Um, which I don't know if you've ever used it, but you, it's a paid subscription, but you can get a phone number that you can call from your phone, oh, yes. but it's not your personal number. Oh, yeah. okay. So it, it protects your own, you know, privacy. That used to be free a long time ago. So. Right. It was free it. until July. Uh -huh. and then our, I actually had one. Yeah. Several years okay. Ago. Yeah. Our school district did, I think, purchase subscriptions for us in the fall. So it's a question I ask myself. I have had a Google Voice number before. You know, do I make myself right. available? But if a parent texts me at 8 o'clock at night asking a question, do I make myself, you know, available to answer those things? Mm -hmm. Or should I, you know, set in my own life a, a boundary of, you know, 8.30 to 4 o'clock? Um, and to be honest, I'm still wrestling with that. I mean, I've thought about, you know, communicating to parents a particular evening, you know, maybe Wednesday evenings. I'm available seven to nine. This is my Google voice number. If you have a concern, you can call or text during that time and I will take your call. But I, I still haven't decided honestly, if that's right. appropriate or, right. or not, um, because I still, you know, I need to be there for my family right. And, right. and all those yes. kinds of things. But I know how frustrating it was. Um, but what I will say is that I would say 95% of the questions that I did get last year from parents were either not understanding where to look to see their child's assignment or wanting to check if their child had completed assignments that their child had told them that they were going to complete. So 
Um, I know our school is working to provide some resources for parents, you know, some video tutorials mm -hmm. kind of showing how to use Google Classroom, how to access the online gradebook that we do. And then I know at the school level, um, for instance, one of the things that parents shared, which I don't know if it's one of those things people didn't think about before, but um, the assignment in Google Classroom was not always titled the same thing as it was in the gradebook. Because in the gradebook, we have like a limited number of okay. characters that show up. And so sometimes, you know, a teacher would email a parent and say, a child is missing assignment X, and they'd go into Google Classroom and couldn't find it because right. they were labeled different things. So I think we're all much more aware of, you know, those kinds of things. How can we make it easier for parents to find, you know, what they're looking for and to just explain to them, you know, this is what it looks like when your child has actually attached something and turned it in, you know, and this is how you can check it and this is, you know, this and that. And, I'm, and then I always think it's just good teaching practice to really front load information for both the student and the teacher or the student and the parent. If you can let them know, this is the expectations, here's the rubric for assessment, here's, here's what I'm looking for and maybe you know, an example of here's, here's an example of what mm -hmm. I'm looking for and really front loading. And I think especially now where we can't actually sit with the child and right. say, like, you mm -hmm. need to do X, Y, Z, um, whether that's making videos or having PDFs or whatever that is, but trying to, trying to front load the information for the family so that it's not a, you know, I've been assigned this thing. I don't know how to do it. I'm firing off questions to Mrs. Martin. She's not getting back to me. I'm getting frustrated, you know, trying right. to kind of eliminate. And I know that there will always be there situations will always be questions. yeah but like that um, and I would say the final thing is just really being on top of keeping everything graded because I think for most parents that was the thing it's like I can't necessarily sit with you while you're doing your assignment but I can check that you have done them and so I think there was much more traffic on the on the electronic grade book than maybe there had been um, before and so um, just trying to really keep on top I mean I, I think I graded every day right and and honestly, for a choir room, I was doing a lot more grading than usual because usually we're rehearsing and then do, you know, kind of a singing quiz partially mm -hmm. the way through. But we kind of had to have evidence of their participation throughout. So, I mean, I was doing a lot of grading. So okay, I think that there's a grade, then I know that people... Right, but I felt, I mean, and it's more than we're asked to do, but right. I just really felt um, last year, all my assignments were always due 3.30 on Friday. So I would stay at the computer and grade everything that had been turned in on time before the weekend started because I really wanted parents to feel like if I went in on the weekend, I could see, yes, my child is caught up, no, my child is behind, this right. is what the questions are. Um, hopefully at a time that they had more time together and could look at it. Didn't always happen, but right. yeah, I mean, was the idea. This whole thing has been a nightmare for everybody. You know? <laughs> I'll be glad when it's over. Yeah, for sure. sure. Next question is, how are you managing your own mental and physical health during all of this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. That's very important. Though. It's, it's a very really important, important to take question. Care of that. <laughs> I actually think I was doing better at the end of the school year last year. And then I think, you know, over the summer and kind of now that I'm anticipating the coming school year, it's yeah. not as not as much. Um, I definitely think, and I know this is true for a lot of my colleagues, is we just have to not be on social media. Ah, There's yeah. just too much um too much negativity too mm -hmm. much um name calling and finger yes. pointing yeah. and um yeah i've read some of the horrible comments on that county's school page <laughs> yeah yes yeah. so, so unfortunately you know scrolling through and seeing my these and nephews photos doesn't quite make up for all of that kind of yeah um yeah. nonsense so you know trying to limit how much of that you know we allow ourselves to take in and I try to remember that people are just frustrated and, yeah. um, you know, we can repair the relationships, I hope, as we, you know, move forward. But um, I have been doing a lot of reading, which mm -hmm. I have not read in ages for fun, but I'm trying to to do that. I'll put a plug. I'm currently reading Grounded by Diana Butler Bass, and it's blowing my mind. So I'm mean, <laughs> just looking for a book to read. Um, that one's great. Um, I'm a pianist and I don't play for fun ever. And so just cause it's my job and, that's, yeah. and I play at church and all those kinds of things. But, um, actually COVID was the first time in ages that I just have sat down at the piano and just played for my own enjoyment. So, uh, with three small kids in the house, 
it's not always peaceful, but it has been, um, you know, nice to kind of rediscover that being outside. I'm not a heat person. So yeah. as soon as summer, I think that was part of it at the end of last year when it was springtime and it was really nice, you know, I would do as much outside as I possibly could. And now that it's hot, I don't want to be outside, but I, I know that that helps to lift my spirit. So I'm hoping here once fall comes and things ease back down in the temperature department that, um, that I will get back home. And then I just think trying to, you know, I'm a social creature. I'm used mm -hmm. to being with all these children. And, you know, now that I'm just with the same four people <laughs> over and over and over again, trying to, and I love them dearly, yeah. um, but just trying to, you know, whether it's virtual or, or otherwise, just trying to, to get in as much socialization as I possibly can. Um, because even once we return to school, we're not really going to be around our colleagues mm -hmm. either. So I think it's definitely going to continue to have the isolation problem, mm -hmm. even though we're kind of going back to work like normal. Yeah. Well, we really enjoyed our time with you today, Christina. Thanks for being here. Thank you for um, having we're me. running out of time, but we still have a lot of good questions that we'd like to ask you. So um, come back next week for part two of this two part series um, of interview with a public school teacher. That's what we'll call it. And remember to embrace the blur slice. <laughs> <laughs>